about Venerable Mary of Agreda. What lessons can we apply to our lives from this Franciscan abbess, spiritual writer, and mystic? Today on The Simple Truth, we consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the pure, strong heart of St. Joseph. I'm Jim Havens. It is Wonder and Awe Wednesday, where we strive to rightly be filled with wonder and awe at the presence of Almighty God and all that is of Him with our co-host Joanne Wright, co-founder of the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Our topic today, again, Venerable Mary of Agreda, born April 2nd, 1602 in Agreda, Spain, also died there on May 24th, 1665, on Pentecost Sunday at the age of 63, also known by the names of Mary of Jesus of Agreda, um, Spanish being Maria de Jesus de Agreda, and also that was her uh, religious name that she took, Sister Marie of Jesus, and then the of Agreda, obviously, uh, to, to the place, uh, but also known as Mother Agreda as she was abbess of the Franciscan uh, community she was a part of, also known as Lady in Blue or the Blue Nun or even the Real Flying Nun for reasons we'll get into in a bit. But Joanne Wright, how are you today? And will you lead us in an opening prayer? I'm good today and we'll talk, we're going to say a prayer to Our Lady, Help of Christians. And <clears throat> we'll talk about why we're, t- we're talking about Our Lady of Help of Christians also today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O Mary, Mother of Mercy, who so often saved Christians from the plague and other bodily scourges by your powerful intercession, help them and deliver them now from the plague of impiety and irreligion, which insinuates itself in a thousand ways into their souls, keeping them from the church and pious practices, especially through sects and the press and perverse schools. We humbly ask you to help the good that they may persevere, strengthen the weak, call the wayward and sinners to repentance so that the truth and kingdom of Jesus Christ may triumph here on earth, thus increasing your glory and that of your son and saving souls. Amen. In the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy spirit. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I, I, Mm -hmm. I, I prayed, I, I was looking up her, her day of her death, which was May 24th, which, um, in her time, it was it fell on the Feast of Pentecost, but it's also the Feast of Our Lady Help of Christians. And in her time, you know, within that hundred years time, we have Our Lady of Guadalupe appearing in Mexico. We have the the Battle of Lepanto. These are all like 15th, 16th century. And because of all that uh, going on, Pius, I believe it was Pius the uh, maybe fifth, no, Pius the seventh on September 15th, because of all these uh, fierce battles she she brought about, she won at the hands of the soldiers. He he instituted the feast of Our Lady Help of Christians was celebrated on May twenty fourth, which is the day of her death. Mother Mary, Sister Mary, I think she was a Mother Abbess, right? Mother Mary Vergreta. Mm-hmm. So it's it's it pertains everything to her because as we'll see. She was she was an evangelist, and she did quite a bit to to bring the faith. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned to the Battle of Lepanto that came up in some of my research here. And uh, for my sources today, just found a bunch of stuff online. So just gonna uh, you know, it's all kind of uh, mixed in. But um, but but I looked into a little bit of the context of the time in Spain. I thought that was interesting. There, seventeenth um, century, early sixteen hundreds. And um, so the 17th century, it was the so-called golden century of the Baroque. Um, It was a century marked by the decadence and the widespread crisis of which Spain did not escape. It was an attitude of mind, apparently, that despised productive work and those who engaged in it. Far too many strove to live the life of a Hidalgo. The treasures of Mexico and Peru, so far from stimulating investment and industrial production had only encouraged men to look for shortcuts to riches. So it seems like uh, you've got New Spain, you've got uh, the, the conquistadors, you got the folks going over there to the New World, uh, Mexico, Peru, even into what would be modern day uh, Texas and New Mexico and uh, Arizona, as we'll get into in some of the the history here, which is just absolutely fascinating. But um, th- these tales of the treasures and everything, so people were men, it seems like young men were looking for shortcuts to riches and wealth and and thought they didn't really 
um, need to work too hard or put much into it. And so this popular, I had to look up this term Hidalgo. I mean, I think I saw the movie Hidalgo once. Don't remember a whole lot uh, from that. I think Vigo Mortensen. Uh, but, uh, but, but as I I I went into this a little bit, everybody's wanting to be this Hidalgo. What, What is this all about? So, um, the term, it identified a nobleman with a hereditary title, um, but in practice, they were exempted from paying taxes, yet they owned little real property. So they had the, the hereditary title, but um, not, not a whole lot else other, other than some, you know, some privileges that they had. <clears throat> but it's really a term for low-born, unmarried nobles of little means who were exempt from paying taxes. And so this actually, um, th- th- this famous work came about right in the time of uh, the infant years, the childhood years of Mary of Agreda there in Spain would have come forth one of the great um, great works of literature that would be known historically um, called uh, Don Quixote. Uh, so this was uh, first published 1605 and then the second part in 1615. And the author, Cervantes, so he was part of the Battle of Lepanto. In 1570, he enlisted in a Spanish Navy infantry regiment, was badly wounded, at the Battle of Lepanto in October 1571, lost the use of his left arm and hand. He was later called El Manco de Lepanto, meaning the one-handed man of Lepanto or the one-armed man of Lepanto, a title that followed him for the rest of his life. But the, the, the I've never read Don Quixote, but uh, it, I looked into the summary a bit and it's the adventures, basically it's a, a satirical sort of work um, about this Hidalgo, this member of lowest nobility, um, who read so many uh, chivalric romances that he loses his mind and decides to become uh, a sort of a knight to revive chivalry and serve his nation under this name Don Quixote. Uh, we get this word now quixotic used to mean the impractical pursuit of idealistic goals. Uh, that's entered common usage. Um, but different schools over the years have, have diagnosed various conditions uh, from paranoia, persistent delusional disorder, uh, to or a healthy even a healthy reaction to a mad world to this character. Um, one commenta- commentator says that uh, Cervantes u- used uh, Don Quixote to satir- uh, satirize the, the romanticized view of chivalry and to critique Spanish society at the time. His obsession, Don Quixote's obsession with chivalry, is portrayed as ridiculous, and his idealism is shown to be out of place in a world that was moved beyond medieval value. So all that to say, this was kind of all stirring in this time in Spain. And, you know, I don't really know quite totally what to make of it other than this sense of worldliness and this pursuit of, um, of riches, of pleasure without having to do hard work. And then also sort of laughing at these romantic ideas of chivalry. And you can almost sort of trace the beginning of, of sort of early enlightenment thought here that we don't need all of these ideas of old anymore. We're going to kind of liberate ourselves from all of this and including, um, you know, I think sort of including ideas about religion. And so all of this was going on. And then you have the Holy Saint, uh, Venerable Mary of Agrita, who's going deeper into fidelity, greater love of God, greater love of Jesus, Our Lady and the Holy Catholic faith. So you have sort of these two things going on at the same time, Joanne. Right. Along comes Mary uh, at the same time. And she was she herself was born of a noble parent. She there were 11 children. She was and she her mother decided she was going to open a, a a convent in the home. So Mary goes in the, the one of the remaining sisters joins and the mother joins. And it, it, I, as I was reading this, I, it, it was hard to figure out she, they just started this order of Franciscans, and uh, and and then at the same time, her father goes off and becomes religious with the, with the two brothers. They said she had she there were eleven children in the family, but these four were left over, and they all became religious. And it was it was legitimate. It it was all uh, brought brought to the Pope. He he, it was a, I think it was Franciscan order of the poor Clares anyway. So she became the abbess, and this was very young. At 17 years old, she started, and it, it was very interesting that that they could just start these orders up, start a convent. So she makes the profession on um, the purification of Our Lady and takes the name Sister Mary of Jesus. That's in 1620. She consecrates herself to God through her holy vows. She strives for perfection, 
surrenders everything to God. And, you know, she was just a hum, hu, hu, humble, um, humble little girl. And she gave her whole life. And that's when it all started. <laughs> she was very holy as a child, but it all started all the by locating in the, in the letters. And um, so there was so much to talk about. And did the by location start first or there the, the, the writings, it was mm-hmm. all, all. Yeah. 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 We can, we can, we can get into that for sure. Yeah. By location was first, I believe it was about 10 years. I think uh, maybe from her age of 19 to 29, um, and we'll get into the hundreds of visits that took place into the New World, into New Spain. Again, modern day uh, Texas, New Mexico area. Um, just absolutely incredible when you hear about this. If you're not aware of this, this is amazing stuff. But yeah, the Order of the Immaculate Conception, these Franciscan conceptionists, uh, originally founded by a saint, St. Beatriz de Silva, um, at the end of the 15th century. It's also known as. Um, the Franciscan Conceptionist, since it unites the Order of Friars Minor for um, with the mystery of the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary. Now, this was before that was a Marian dogma. That didn't happen until 1854. So this is a precursor to that. Obviously, the, 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 the truth of that has always been, and the theology was there. Uh, we're going to get into much more when we get back. Stay tuned. Jim Havens here with Joanne Wright discussing the life of Venerable Mary of Agreda today. We'll put out the phone phone number in a little bit if you have any questions or comments on the topic today. We want to get to that by location, but first, just one more word on the Franciscan Conceptionist, this this religious order of which Mary and her mother uh, began as a convent in their home. Uh, they, They started their own convent there, so continued on. Uh, this religious order, but this was founded uh, again in the 15th century. The saint who founded it, uh, St. Beatriz de Silva, um, it says here that she founded it for the service, contemplation, and celebration of the mystery of Mary in her immaculate conception. And it says that according to their general constitutions, the conceptionist, as they called themselves, is called to live the attitudes of Mary in following Christ. Well, that's a pretty good instruction for religious life or for anyone's life. Live the attitudes of Mary in following Christ. Um, how beautiful. And again, ahead of her time here, um, the, the saint that founded this order, as well as uh, Mary of Agrita, Venerable Mary of Agrita and her mother, and this devotion to Our Lady and the Immaculate Conception hundreds of years before the dogma was defined. And, um, and that's actually, as we get into her writings that's one of the controversies with some of her writings is that some of some of what she says has not been quite defined yet. But again, theologically, um, it's all there. And could there be a fifth uh, Marian dogma on the horizon? Well, many have been talking about this now for probably over 100 years. And, and so, um, yeah, could she just be ahead of her time once again? Again, the theology is there and it's rock solid. We'll get into that. But in terms of the bilocation, it does say that between 1621 and and 1631, when she was aged 19 to 29 years of years of age, uh, Sister Mary of Agrita bilocated over 500 times. It would happen while she was praying. Her body remained in the cloistered convent, but at the same time, she would find herself in the continent of North America and um, evangelizing the Native American peoples there, uh, again, as early as 1621. So the same time the pilgrims are coming over, you have this uh, this cloistered Spanish nun uh, who is also showing up to the Native Americans in the Southwest. Um, so, and this is this is the historical account on this uh, is so rock solid. It's one of the most rock solid historical accounts of bilocation that we have. It's just extraordinary. And I did read one account that was talking about how this would occur, um, at least maybe mostly, or what it was telling me was that um, during mass, after she received our Lord Jesus in the Holy Eucharist is when she would often go into these um, bilocations. Uh, so that's that's rather interesting as well, Joanne. Yeah, I think <clears throat> we, we didn't talk about um, her austere practices. She, she was, um, she didn't, she didn't eat meat, milk, cheese, eggs. She she abstained from all these uh, 
delectable foods, you know, nourishing foods, actually. And at night, she would sleep just a few hours on a board. And and the rest of the night, she'd be praying her devotions. So I think this was all in in preparation for the bilocation. And and at one point um, of the many ecstasies she experienced, one of them, she was shown the whole earth and a small number of souls who knew God, and then this vast number who did not. And those who did not belong to the church, God revealed these people of New Mexico and all the surrounding areas. And he said, these were the ones most inclined to his mercy. So her ardent desire, her prayers and sacrifices for their conversion resulted in this grace to bilocate. So it, it was it was a preparation for all this. It didn't just happen. And she was very, she was very holy. She would uh, carry her own cross and, and pray the way of the cross every night. You know, she formed her, you know, her own big old piece of wood. So it, it wasn't just, you know, she'd go to bed, say her prayers, and this happened. Very austere, very austere and humble and mortifying kind of person she was. Yeah, this goes along with that. And I found this incredibly interesting. It says that um, when she would appear to these Native American Indians, um, that, uh, and then um, she would go to this one tribe, the uh, Yumano tribe, um, I think it is, and then other tribes by flying through the sky and proceeding then to teach them about the Catholic faith. So they would see her actually flying through the sky in um, in her habit, which was a white habit with a sort of a blue cloak over it. And so she would teach them then about the Catholic faith. This resulted, it said, in many occasions of her being tortured and left for dead by those Native Americans but then she would return to her body in Spain unharmed. Later, she would reappear to those same Indians who were completely dumbfounded as to how she was still alive. Um, so just that alone is just uh, absolutely incredible. Um, but then, yeah, the historical account where then the, the Franciscan missionaries show up and she's sending the, Ameri- the, the Native American peoples go to where they are. She's telling them where they are. Go to them and ask to be baptized. They're showing up to these Franciscan missionaries who think they're encountering these people for the first time to share the faith with them. These people already know the Catholic faith and they're asking for baptism and they're saying, how do you know this? And they're saying the blue, the blue lady, right? The blue nun. And, uh, and then it, it eventually becomes where she tells, I think her confessor, her confessor reports it um, to the, um, the, the superior general of the Franciscans, a letter is written over to the Franciscan missionaries in uh, in North America at that time. And so then they get this letter about this, that she is by locating, she's having these encounters. It, it, it adds up to what they're encountering. Then one of those priests comes back, meets with her in the convent, and she's telling him details that he could that she could not possibly know unless she was there, including about this one-eyed Indian uh, chief and, and, and many other uh, things as well. So just an incredible historical account uh, on this, a paper trail of receipts that you can follow uh, that really says this actually happened, Joanne. Yeah, yeah. The Indians asked for priests to be sent to them. And in fact, they were so adamant and, and so on fire for the faith, they walked 500 miles to find th- these these missionaries. Now, how they would find them, she must have told them where to where to contact them or whatever. But they went over, and at that point, um, they they asked the lady in blue said, "Get get get yourself baptized. They'll do it." And so I think they ended up baptizing and catechizing. Well, they were all catechized, but baptizing ten thousand people. And then these other tribes started coming, and they saw all this happening, and they're carrying a wooden cross with flowers. I mean, they know about Jesus Christ at this point. And, and they're bringing their babies. They all want to be instructed, you know, more in the faith. And, you know, she could just do so much. She just told them all about Jesus. But they wanted to be full, firm Catholics. It was, it, yeah, like you said, you can't deny it. And to this day, uh, to this day, Our Lady of the Lady in Blue is, is still very relevant in Texas. Apparently, their, their blue flower is is reminiscent of what happened after she came, this blue bonnet flower. That's that's on their flag, their fl- their state flower. So this is all this is all ingrained into the people in that area. And it mm-hmm. came down through the through the years. Yeah, yeah. As the story goes, uh, there was no report of 
such a flower. And then after this lady in blue, uh, Mary of Agreda, after she disappeared, after one encounter, um, then they started seeing these these blue flowers, these blue bonnet flowers, and so um, so very much um, associated with the lady in blue. And um, and yeah, it's interesting how even even as much as secularism tries to drive out all that is faithful, all that is uh, of good and holy religion from our culture, um, it, they they can't do it. Just like. You know all the all the uh, the cities that are named after saints up and down uh, the the West Coast and into into the Southwest. Um, I mean, it's it's just incredible the history, the Catholic history um, that that has taken place. And um, and also when you go to um, the the state park website. So let me just see if I have the right one here. It, it looks like it's right here. This National Park Service website about the Pueblo missions in New Mexico. And it, it talks about this there. It, they're in Mountain Air, New Mexico, and um, yeah, just incredible. They, they, this is all still there. You can you can go uh, to these places. That the stories are still present, um, even in a sort of um, secularized way that that can't be denied the, the, the historical accuracy of all of this. And um, and I would just throw in at this point as well, even though you know we'll talk about her death when we get to it. Uh, the fact is, is that she was found, her body was found hundreds of years later after her death in corrupt. Um, again, a hundred years after that, they looked at it again. It was in the same state in corrupt, perfectly intact. Um, so there are various signs attached to Venerable Mary of a greeter that, that are just absolutely undeniable. The fact that she's not yet beatified, the fact that she's not yet canonized um, is is a very strange thing. And it really, the reason why is because the, the case has been open multiple times, um, but it really all centers around controversy of the great, uh, the, the great work. She wrote a number of books, but the, the big work that she wrote, The Mystical City of God, which is 2,600 pages long. And, um, and so this was written following um, enlightenment and conversations with the Blessed Virgin Mary, and it details our Lady's devotion to God, her many graces and visits to heaven while she was alive on earth, her marriage to St. Joseph at the age of 14, the birth and life of Jesus, uh, her participation in the events of our Lord's passion and death, how she became the mother of the church and the co-redemptrix and mediatrix through which all graces are outpoured. Um, and um, it, it goes on to, to talk about how um, the angels served the Blessed Virgin, devils warred against her, how she kept the Holy Eucharist present within her heart, uh, and so much more, but it was very controversial. It, the, the Spanish Inquisition was on at the time. She, in fact, was um, interrogated, I think, a couple times in her life, um, but it, every time they found her to be um, a holy woman, and uh, it was she was always um, uh, basically praised after the interrogation. But um, but then this work actually found its way to the forbidden uh, books uh, from the Vatican, and uh, and because there were appeared to be some the theological issues. I mean, again, ahead of her time on the Immaculate Conception, ahead of her time on the Assumption, and I would say still ahead of her time on the co-redemptrix and the mediatrix of all graces, um, which theologically is all there, but it's yet to be solemnly defined into doctrine, into dogma within the Catholic Church. So I think her time's going to come. I think we're going to be saying Blessed Mary of Agreda at a certain point and Saint Mary of Agreda at a certain point uh, if the... Uh, if earthly life goes on long enough, but, uh, but we'll see at this point, venerable Mary of a great, uh, uh, pray for us, Joanne. Yes. She, she, she was very obedient. Um, and in these manuscripts, she was first, I don't think she would have re even written a thing down, but she, she had several spiritual directors and a couple told her, write it, write it down. And then they come and go. And then the other two more come burn those, get rid of them. So finally, her, the final spiritual director says, write, write it all back up. And, and, and I, want, I want this to be known. And she trusted him. And that's when, you know, all these works came out. But, you know, had she, had she continued with these others and burned these works, it probably didn't matter much to her because she's under obedience to them and under obedience to Our Lady. Everything was given to her by Our Lady. So very humble, very obedient. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. An amazing, faithful woman who, um, who who loved our Lord and loved Our Lady as the perfect way to love our Lord 
uh, through the Immaculate Heart of our Blessed Mother Mary. If you want to call in, any comment, any question on this, anything you want to share on Venerable Mary of Agreda, one 511 5483 That's 1-877-511-5483. We'll be right back. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network presents Saints and Seasons. On May 15th, we celebrate the feast of St. John Baptist de La Salle, confessor. De La Salle was born in the year of our Lord 1651 to a wealthy family in Reims, France, and entered the seminary in Paris once he was 19. He was an excellent and pious student, but after the deaths of his mother and then his father a year later, the seminarian was forced to return home and care for his siblings. He nonetheless continued his studies and was finally ordained a priest in 1678. Through work with the Sisters of the Child Jesus, de La Salle became involved in assisting teachers at free schools in Reims. In 1681, de La Salle resigned all other positions, gave the remains of his personal fortune to the poor, and founded a new teaching order of consecrated laymen called the Institute of the Brothers of the Christian Schools. De La Salle persevered through material difficulties and ecclesiastical opposition, introducing many innovative teaching methods to help educate poor children. Though the exhausting efforts contributed to his death at 68 years of age, on Good Friday in the year of our Lord 1719, the Christian brothers were approved by the Pope six years later and survived the French Revolution to eventually spread worldwide. De La Salle was proclaimed a patron of teachers in 1950. Also honored on this day are St. Isidore the Farmer in the modern calendar, St. Sophia of Rome, and many other martyrs, confessors, and holy virgins. For more about the saints and seasons of the Catholic Church, visit thestationofthecross.com forward slash saints and seasons. The Station of the Cross began broadcasting in Buffalo, New York in 1999. Since then, our listening areas have multiplied and expanded into several states. While our mission is to grow the Catholic faith through radio and other media outlets, our apostolate is supportive of but independent from your local diocese. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Joanne Wright talking about Venerable Mary of Agreda today on the show. I want to go to a little uh, a little bit from this book, The Life of St. Joseph as Seen by the Mystics, compiled by Paul Thigpen. And so uh, one of the sources that he uses here is Mary of Agreda, Venerable Mary of Agreda, and her work, uh, Mystical City of God, the mystical city. And so it says here, and, and by the way, I believe you can find this as a nice four volume set, the English translation of it uh, at Tan Books, tanbooks.com. Um, but it says here that uh, this was first conceived nine years after Mary became a nun, but then written down 10 years later at the command of her confessor. Uh, and again, like Joanne was saying in the last segment, she wrote the first part um, consisting of 400 pages in only, t- in only 20 days. Um, and, and her desire was to keep it from publication Uh, But a copy was sent to the Spanish king, Philip IV, and then later in obedience to another confessor, uh, again, as Joanne was saying, she she threw it out, she burned it. This would kind of go back and forth. The next confessor would come back and say, no, write it again. She'd write it again. The next one came, you got to burn it. They burned it. Finally, uh, they said, write it down again. So she did all of this in obedience. She finished the project in 1670. And, um, and so there's, um, there's an issue here where it says that she herself had been reluctant to see it published, perhaps thinking that the visions were intended more for her personal reflection than for public dissemination. And that much of what she saw and heard, as she often put it, was indescribable in the first place. Um, I I do want to say though, um, that, uh, and I want to get into the value of these writings a little bit as we go. Um, uh, I won't do it right now, but, um, but just talking about kind of private revelation and these writings. And we know that, uh, also blessed and Catherine Emmerich, who we went over a couple episodes ago, uh, she also had similar sorts of writing. So, so what are we really to make of these writings? How can they be of value to us? I want to talk about that a bit, but I want to first give you the words of, uh, Dom Prosper, uh, Geringer, uh, servant of God, Prosper, uh, Geringer. And so it says that, um, in his time, uh, in this, in, in time, however, Mary's mystical work, Mary of Agreda's mystical work attracted uh, an enthusiastic international following, uh, servant of God, Prosper Geringer, the celebrated abbot of the Benedictine monastery, uh, in France. He wrote 24 articles in defense of the book. He concluded, quote, 
the revelations of Mary of Agreda on the life of the Blessed Virgin have a right to the respect and the, the esteem of all those who are capable of undertaking to read them. They deserve to occupy a distinguished place among writings of that kind, and the judicious use that can be made of them can serve as a powerful stimulus to a revival of devotion in souls, end of quote. And this is what we've seen. Uh, th- there are various testimonies, many testimonies of people who have read this work and they, they, consider, they consider this helping them to, um, to, to get their heart back right, uh, to, to come back to the, the Catholic faith, um, to, to really believe in the truths of the, of the church, to believe in Jesus, to believe in what he has revealed in the church that he died to give us the Catholic church and enter back into the sacramental life and, and say yes to the, to the full authoritative teachings on, on faith and morals that the church transmits to us. So uh, this can be a, a great blessed um, work for us, for our devotion um, that can, um, that can definitely serve us well. Um, but again, th- we'll get into it in a little bit uh, later about, you know, we want to make sure that we do see this in the right way. There is kind, kind of an erroneous way we can look at these writings, but if we understand the place in proper devotion, uh, these can serve us very well, Joanne. Right. Regardless of all those writings, uh, she had she had a correspondence with with um, the Spanish mark, monarch Philip the Fourth, I believe, and uh, he it was about twenty years, and and they they have records of maybe six hundred letters going back and forth. He'd he'd ask her questions. On one side of the paper, she'd answer on the other side. And this is all from her cell. It wasn't like she was out in the palace going going there. He'd send her these letters and she'd respond. And he would ask her questions about the wars and the quarrels between France and Portugal and all these different. And she was giving him advice. And you can almost think that um, how, how how many wars were were not didn't come come about because of her her godly advice she also told him about his catholic duties before god because he had kind of a disordered personal life and she reminded him that he's a catholic leader and he's very accountable to the world and then it wasn't just this king she wrote to popes she had letters to popes other kings generals of religious orders bishops nobles and every class of persons in the church and society and and a lot of these have been lost, but some are are still around. And um, again, it was all from her little cell. And when did she have time to write the City of God? When she was writing to all these these big important people and giving them advice on the world, and we got through it, right? Wouldn't it be Wouldn't it be wonderful if there is a beautiful mystic that could, you know, uh, advise our popes and leaders and bishops and we're on our own, right? Well, who knows? I mean, there's a lot we, we don't know. I mean, there could be correspondences taking place that we <laughs> are not aware be. of. So who there knows? Could be. But, um, but uh, we know that uh, certainly our We're Lord still here. and our Lady, our Lord and our Lady are present to all of our leaders. If only they humble themselves and listen, mm-hmm. um, as God the Father uh, spoke uh, several times during the public ministry of Jesus, listen to him, right? So he's there. Uh, it, it's been spoken. We've got the faith. It's just a matter of our people, including leaders, uh, willing to humble themselves and receive, receive it, receive the love that God has for them, the blessing that God has for them. Why do they want to refuse it? Why do we want to refuse it in our pride and foolishness? Let us humble ourselves and receive it. And that is the basis, the foundation of every saint. Very, very simple that it's available for anybody. It's available for the smallest child of the age of reason that we can humble ourselves and relieve, and receive the love and the goodness and the blessing that Jesus died to give us to pour out for us. Uh, thanks be to God. So um, that's that's for all of us. And yes, we have to keep uh, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. And um, yeah, may there be um, some some holy correspondences uh, to take place. Whatever it takes in terms of mediation to to, to get. Uh, to get the folks there, may it be done. But um, but I do want to speak about uh, the value of this writing and also blessed um, blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich as well, because I just think it's important just to make sure that we have a right view of this so that we can properly make use of this for devotional purposes. Uh, the writings, these are great writings that, that, that are here. However, sometimes people want to make of them almost like a, 
uh, like they're on par with sacred scripture or like they're, it's like a fifth gospel. It's not right. This is not that this is private revelation. And so we don't have to, it's, it's there to be used for, for private devotion. Uh, but it's not something that, uh, you even have to believe in. Um, however, I would say these are holy, uh, very holy people that have written these writings and, they seem to be very genuine, authentic in in what God was doing in their lives. So I would say they are gifts from heaven to us uh, through these holy saints, but we have to keep it in proper order. And it says here that the the, the writings themselves, the, um, the mystics themselves, they certainly w- would advise us to avoid the error of thinking them anything more than private revelation for devotional purposes. However, because even when you take these things together, they don't even always line up. For instance, this is uh, Paul Thigpen now in Life, The Life of St. Joseph as Seen by the Mystics. He says that uh, Mary of Agreda reported, for example, that both of Mary's parents had died by the time that she and Joseph were betrothed. And Catherine Emmerich, on the other hand, spoke of St. Anne's remarriage after Joachim's death and described her extensive involvement in the life of the Holy Family. How, we might ask, could these alleged private revelations truly be from God if they obviously display such inconsistencies among themselves, not to mention certain historical inaccuracies? And so then he goes on to quote this scholar, Father Auguste Poulain, who in his classic treatise on mystical theology uh, states the following. He says, when visions represent historic scenes, they often have an approximate and probable likeness only. It is a mistake to attribute an absolute accuracy to them. Many saints have, in fact, believed that the event took place exactly as they saw it, but God does not deceive us when he modifies certain details. If he tied himself down to absolute accuracy in these matters, we should soon be seeking to satisfy in visions an idle desire for erudition in history or archaeology. He has a nobler aim, that of the soul's sanctification. He is like a painter who in order to excite our piety is content to paint scenes in his own manner, but without departing too far from the truth. And the the scholar priest adds a very important note. This argument cannot be applied to the historical books of the Bible. That's not the way the public revelation of sacred scripture works. Um, But this is the way that private revelation works in this way. So you almost think in these ecstasies, Um, what they were seeing in the life of our Lord, of our lady of St. Joseph and all that was surrounded it, surrounding it, um, this, um, this sense of really diving deep into those mysteries. And, um, and sometimes, yeah, I would say there would be historical accuracy. Um, but, uh, but we cannot pin it down and say these are infallible in any way. No way. Uh, we can't say it's exactly this way, but they are again there for, to be considered for our devotional purposes to kind of fill in the blanks, uh, of some of the uh, the episodes in the the life of Christ our lady saint joseph that we have um in the scriptures um so they they are helpful in that way to sort of consider uh, a, a little bit more on the details a little bit more on what it may have been like joanne right and in, in one sense the church is t- calling her venerable in her incorrupt body and these beautiful writings and um you know you can't deny what happened with the indians but then, then there's um, pieces of her works. It's, for instance, the in the City of God, she writes that Our Lady is the co-redemptrix. And now we all heard, you know, there's groups that want to ask the Vatican, please, please make this the fifth dogma, whatever. But, but the church is always the last word on everything, and we have to wait. And, you know, it makes sense to us. Maybe she... She does. She she's is a rede- she's co-redeemer, whatever. She's a co-redemptrix in in certain ways. I mean, we can understand that in our minds, but the church has not given that to us yet. So, again, like like groups will want to, you know, push this. And I, I don't believe it's up to us. We have to wait for the church's discernment sure, on the whole thing. We- yeah, but you would not have said that right. same exact. Yeah, it, yes and no, because you wouldn't say, in one sense, yes, we wait until the dogma to say 100% infallibly sure. However, we wouldn't wait until 1854 to say that Mary was immaculately conceived. Right. I mean, Lourdes was before that. Uh, St. Catherine Labore was before that. Um, Saint, you know, the, the, the Franciscan conceptionists were before that. So this was... 
This was already there theologically um, in, in various ways. And so the same is true, actually. I remember taking a course at Franciscan with uh, Dr. Mark Maravalli. He went into it in depth. I mean, he's a big promoter of the fifth Marian dogma. Uh, and this has, again, been, been, uh, uh, um, been promoted for a long time. I think the hope was that maybe in Vatican II they were going to uh, go ahead and go forward on this, and they didn't. I think that was a, probably a big disappointment that that didn't take place. But co-redemptrix, uh, many of the popes have already stated this in their writings in various ways. Great theologians and saints have already talked about this. And what does it mean? It really, it's our Lord Jesus is the is the Redeemer, right? But Mary is a co-redeemer in the sense that in under him, in submission to him, um, she also is cooperating in his redemption um, in, in a way and as mediatrix of all graces that uh, the graces that flow from our Lord, he has given uh, to her and they flow through her to us. I think it's as simple as going back even to, you know, the, the earliest uh, Marian dogmas that kind of even speak to this a bit when, when we just think of, I think we talked about it last week about death uh, through Eve, life through Mary. Um, Jesus comes to us through Mary. And, um, and that's a, a simple statement that I think, again, we can see very, very clearly. And so co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces, these are just a, a greater fleshing out of that truth in a more defined way. Um, and so, yeah, I think theologically we can say this is true, um, but can we say infallibly um, that we know 100%? No, we do have to wait until it would be solemnly defined by the church. Okay. Um, and then... It's no longer optional for people to believe it or not. The church, when they do that, is saying this is now a doctrine of the faith um, and you are you either believe it or you don't. You either believe the Catholic faith or you don't. And this is non-negotiable. So that's the big difference, I would say, Joanne. Great. Thank you for that. Very well said. And I we we can believe it. But until the church says it, we don't have to believe it. <laughs> right. right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly, Thank you, yeah. Jim. We're going to be back with much more. Stay tuned. Truth Jim Havens here with Joanne Wright talking about Venerable Mary of Agreda here today. If you have any comment, question, thought, insight, anything you want to share on this topic, 1 877 511 5483. That's 1 877 511 5483. As we uh, are, are drawing near to Pentecost Sunday ourselves coming up this Sunday, it says here that Mother Mary of Agreda died. On Pentecost morning, May 24th, 1665, at 9 o'clock, the same time the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles. Many miracles occurred at the 63-year-old's grave. Her extraordinary holiness and virtue is so well known that the process of beatification was taken up almost immediately. Eight years later, she was declared venerable by Pope Clement X. Um, And then I do want to just uh, add this as well, that, um, again, her body... Uh, has remained incorrupt all of these years. Even though she died over 400 years ago, her body has not deteriorated. Her casket was first opened in 1909, and a scientific investigation was carefully made. Another investigation was made in 1989, and her body was still in the same condition as it was 80 years earlier. Her body may be found in the Church of the Conceptionists in Agreda, Spain. The fact that her body has remained unchanged since death is proof that the words... Uh, written in the mystical city of God are true. Um, may the venerable Mary of Agreda finally receive the recognition she deserves to officially become a saint. That's the the end of this article. How they uh, how they close it up, anyway. So um, so yeah, death on uh, Pentecost. What a what, what a wonderful uh, feast to die on, and then also um, and, and and a feast to be born into eternal life on, and then uh, this uh, the, the great miracles that surround her death as well as. Uh, her incorrupt body, uh, which you could go uh, go check out for yourself in a greatest Spain to this day. Uh, incredible stuff, Joanne. Yeah, and the 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 works are incredible. There's so many um, volumes, and but but they're different uh, different pieces. Like I was going through this one um, chapter ten on the mystical city of God, and it's the victory of Christ over hell. And she's she sees like Lucifer and the d- demons. They they still at this point don't even realize that Jesus is the savior, you know, and Mary has them equally dumbfounded. 
And so they go through his last words. She goes through his, and and the torment that these demons felt. It it is so uh, profound, and and you can imagine what what hell is like, what the demons are like, and their hatred, and just and and this is just one one chapter. Christ Christ defeat over hell, and I think that's just such a, a beautiful. Uh, meditation on a Friday, a first Friday or good Friday for that matter during Holy Week and, and, and much less in May. There's so many, so many different um, aspects of Our Lady's life. It's, it's, it's just a great uh, meditation book. And like you said, it, if it takes you further into your spiritual life and it, they found that the church has found there's nothing that's in, that's not, um, not Catholic in it, you know, it, 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 nothing goes against the faith. Let's put it that way. So, so as a meditation, we can't, we can't know that it's all true. We can't, you know, pretend that every, every word is law, but if it brings you closer to Christ and to our lady, do it, do it. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, recommended for devotional purposes for sure. And uh, and yeah, you know, I, I always want to be as accurate as I possibly can. I strive to be um, 100% accurate. I, I, I would hate to say anything that it would be uh, wrong. I'm sure I misspeak from time to time. And I was just thinking about something that I said in that last segment where I was saying that Our Lady of Lords was before the de- defining of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. That didn't ring quite right. And I did just look it up. And uh, I was incorrect on that. So it was 1854 for the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, 1858, the first apparition of Our Lady of Lourdes. But um, but St. Catherine Labore, that would have been, I believe, 1830. So that was earlier, as well as other um, uh, saints and and things where the Immaculate Conception was coming up before the solemn definition that uh, that was long delayed for, for many, many people who... Um, we're, um, we're, we're asking for it to be defined for, um, for hundreds of years, uh, beforehand. So that was the point there. But as we look, as we take a step back, Joanne, and look at the big picture of the life of venerable Mary of Agreda, what is your real takeaway in terms of, um, applying this to our own lives? I mean, again, this, so much of it seems so extraordinary, so unique to this one person, just these special graces that she received in so many ways. And we can easily just say, well, that's an extraordinary example. That has nothing to do with me. But how do you apply it to your own life? What would you um, What would you say would be a, a good lesson that we can take away? Like I said, you know, she there were holy times. Bring on holy holy people, and it, it's discouraging to think that um, you know what. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a, a Mary of Agreda here, and and you know, and the way everything we can hear the news in a minute and we would find out about this uh, beautiful mystic in our own times and yet i'm sure there's millions and they're hidden and uh, mary was hidden and yet she was brought brought out of her cell to to bilocate and and baptize ten thousand and talk to kings and, and and princes and popes uh i think I think we we have to stand firm and believe that the time is going to come. And St. Louis de Montfort told us there's going to be saints, whether whether they're martyral saints, whether they're mystical saints. The time is going to come where this good is going to overcome the evil, and you know we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna jump and know heaven will be our reward. Mm-hmm. That's all I can yeah. say. <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's really interesting. Yeah. That, what that makes me think of is, um, yeah, to, to be obviously, um, very much focused in on our own fidelity, our own sanctification. Um, but not in a, in a way that is a, a sort of self-centered way where we're kind of turning in on ourselves in a way that really takes us out of ourselves and points us outward on mission. And this is what we see in her life, even though she was a cloistered nun what was, she was occupied with yes a, a life of prayer a life of faith um, but also outwardly turned and very much concerned about the salvation of souls conversion of others and, and wanting to be on mission for the lord 
in both a mystical way, she was able, I think her desire was so great that God granted her this blessing, this extraordinary bilocation, but then in a very practical way, this sort of letter writing campaign uh, that she would do. Now, that is something we, we could all take up, and I'm sure there are other sort of practical examples folks could think of as well. How do we even, even though, yes, our lives should reflect something of a of a hidden tone, right? But at the same time, still on mission, maybe something like a letter writing campaign, writing to um, maybe just asking God, who do you want me to, to write to? What would you like me to say? Maybe just praying with that, God would um, would inspire something that could really impact someone's life in, in a very big way. Joanne. Yeah. So her last words after um, that chapter I was talking about, she's she's telling, she's telling, um, our lady's telling her, but soon the charity, zeal and devotion in many of the faithful began to grow cold and they forgot the blessings of the redemption. They yielded to their carnal inclinations and desires. They loved vanity and avarice and permitted themselves to be fascinated and deceived by the false pretenses of Lucifer, obscuring the glory of their savior and brought them into the meshes of their mortal enemies. This foul ingratitude has thrown the world into the present state and has encouraged the demons to rise up in their pride against God, audaciously presuming to possess themselves of all the children of Adam on account of this forgetfulness and carelessness of Catholics. Mm, truer words, truer words. Yeah, Venerable Mary of Agreda, pray for us. And um, yeah, we'll keep uh, we'll keep praying and trying to d- discern. All right, Lord, what do you want us to present week in, week out here? We hope that uh, it's of benefit to you. It's something that hopefully is edifying and helping you to uh, continue to advance, take some consolation in some community here, even over a broadcast that uh, you got some folks that um, are uh, are encouraging you on walking with you and wanting to move forward. If you want to reach out to us, any suggestion, comments, Jim H at the station of the cross.com. God bless you. God bless you.